Hey everyone, it's Oakley, and big news coming out of Creative Assembly. A new blog for Total War Three Kingdoms on Diplomacy Part 1. There's going to be multiple ones, obviously. And the reason for this is because it's a big, new, beefy feature that they're adding. Uh, so the announcement does come along with this blog plus YouTube videos. So what we're doing in this video uh, itself is going to be essentially scrubbing through the YouTube video, providing some commentary, and pointing out some things that I've found in the video that aren't explicitly being talked about. And then we'll tab on over to this page uh, in order to rope in some of the additional context that they've given us uh, through this blog in case you haven't read it. Um, I'll give you a quick summary, but uh, yeah, it's definitely worth your while. A lot of good content here. So let's go and pop on over to that video. So get started with the traditional ink blot, the art style that we're growing more and more custom to and that I am increasingly excited by. So it's looking all very good. So you start us off here. And uh, a couple of things that we can start to see. Well, one, now we get to see more and more of the map of China. Uh, super large, tons to explore, the great rivers, uh, and lots of territories. One of the things you'll notice about the territories as we zoom in is that some of these are marked with more village icons, whereas some of them are uh, smaller towns or even farmsteads, as we'll see. Uh, and as we get into this, if you look at the top left, it's a little obscured here by the YouTube disclaimer, but basically it says spring 190. So that means, you know, if they're telling us it's spring, then you, you know, you're going to have fall, winter, etc. So that probably indicates that we're going to be looking at four turns per year, which is pretty cool. The start date of 190 is something we knew before. Just for context, in the end of the previous year, uh, Dong Zhuo, here he is, had taken the opportunity to seize control, de facto control, at Luoyang. Uh, so he is essentially reigning as the new emperor uh, or holding being the puppet master of the young emperor uh, So yeah, he's up there So he's about to start the dominoes that are gonna create the whole three kingdoms battling for the throne Battling for different areas. So all of this is about to be kicked off uh, So they're gonna zoom us in here uh, on Liu Biao and It's gonna be pretty cool what we get to see so for one it looks absolutely gloriously beautiful that's to be expected and then now we start to see a little bit more of the faction leaders, the traits, etc. So the main ones, authority, expertise, cunning, resolve, and instinct. So very thematic here, and you're going to be toggling up and down on those. It's interesting to see, uh, I guess, these attributes being different than, I guess, your unit stats. So you may tech them up differently. I was expecting to see stuff more along the lines of, like, I don't know, the way of the warrior or different ways to, you know, pimp out your bow style or something like that. Perhaps that's over on the unit stats um, feature. Uh, this is more, I guess, how it pertains to your relationship to other people's uh, diplomacy, etc. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, we still haven't seen much in terms of like the skill tree or how things are going to develop in terms of, like kind of the, the Three Kingdoms storyline that you can follow. Uh, but this is what it looks like when you bring up your character. So again, as I said, it doesn't seem like you can go up a particular skill tree, although maybe here it's obscured, so you can't quite see it. Um, but what I was thinking beforehand is, hey, maybe we'll get a skill tree like you have in Warhammer where you can tech up a certain aspect of your military combat because, you know, the way the heroes are fighting in the game, especially in the Three Kingdoms version, seems very much like a Warhammer lord. Um, but glad to see that they're toning it back down and not going super heavy in that direction. Uh, so that's one of my main takeaways here. Another thing that we can start to look at is, um, well, let's take a look down here at the military. So the first thing to notice here is something that we were told before, which is essentially that now when you go into battle, you're going to have multiple commanders, and each is going to be bringing along with them their separate retinue. So the main one here has a curtain retinue of four separate units, and you can see these here on the bottom left. Those are the ones he's bringing along. And then special units that he can then recruit, one of them being locked, the other two are going to be special ones. So this is something that CIA has said previously, and I just want to remind you of that, that if you want to get certain types of units, it's not about building the specific building chain to get there. It's actually going to be more so tied to different commanders. So if you want a certain type of cavalry or a hybrid infantry archer unit, you need to go solicit the aid of that commander. Uh, which is going to make it more interesting. So changing up your approach to to getting uh, special types of units. If you want more cavalry, uh, good cavalry, you're going to have to solicit the help of the northern lords, etc. Stuff like that. This is one of the things I'm not super clear on. Is there still like a, uh, a building tree aspect to unlocking units? I tried to ask that of CA and they said last time that they weren't quite ready to hear that. In this video, they're not going to talk about it too much. So that's still something I'm waiting to hear about. 
But uh, anyways, that's a little bit of musings about what we can see in this part of the UI. Uh, looking on the left side, this is going to be pretty cool. These are going to be all your, I think what they call them is ancillary. So it's basically all stuff that gets tied to your character. So of course, weapons, here he's holding five of them, which is pretty cool. I guess as your faction leader, one of them is going to be, you know, the one that your primary one that you wield in battle. I'm sure the other ones are more like ceremonial that you can then give out to different lords or give you stats or renowned and you know, probably boost up some authority if you have the great sword of, you know, XYZ or, or things like that. So that's why maybe you have multiple weapons. Um, armor sets will increase your stats, but then of course, you know, you, if you have more than you can carry, I'm sure some of them will just be sitting on the sidelines and just boost some of your, um, your traits. Uh, mounts as well, so you can collect horses. Uh, followers here, he currently has one. It's not showing for some reason. Uh, and accessories, he has two. So accessory here shows a fan, but you can get pr probably different trinkets and icons. So these are all things that are going to boost the stats of your character. And as we'll be seeing later when they start to discuss diplomacy and kind of deals that you can strike, you can trade all of these between characters. And these items are also things that when you defeat an enemy lord, you can, uh, I believe, scavenge their items and take them to your retinue. I don't know what the total uh, number is. Obviously, you can carry a lot of them, you know, up to five weapons. So perhaps it's bottomless. Just keep slaying lords and you get a stack of swords to make an iron throne with. That would be cool. Uh, but yeah, so that's, yeah, we've talked about those two uh, pains here. Uh, what else can we pull out? Uh, well, as we look around the screen down here, this is going to be interesting. So clicking on him, you see... Um, soldiers is 770. Um, it's probably just the total number of soldiers in the army here. You guys will have to do the quick math. It does seem a bit shy to me. 160, 160, so you have 300, and then another 600. Okay, that adds up to about 770. So yeah, that's, um, that's going to be your army. Next here is going to be the amount of earnings that you have per turn. Um, Yellow is probably how much travel distance you can have, and then the, the green bar is maybe your overall health, maybe getting that mixed up. Uh, I did see some indications that we may be seeing a return of the supply system and attrition. I'm hoping that's the case. They didn't quite talk about it, um, but yeah, we see that um, here. It's a wheelbarrow, so I'm hoping this is actually going to be a supply system, kind of like the one that we saw um, in Thrones of Britannia. That would be really cool and very uh, representative of the period. I'm going to try and pause here because I think last time I looked at this, there's there was one of them. Uh, no, I don't see it. Uh, that was going to help you out. And and that mentioned supplies. Looks like I don't see it. We'll have to keep an eye out for that. Uh, but anyways, the traits here that are going to be mixes essentially of the attributes on the left. Um, so yeah, pretty interesting. And then the other one here that's not necessarily an attribute, but that's more like... Um, uh, that's something important to keep an eye on is going to be your satisfaction meter. This is something that applies to all characters and satisfaction is essentially um, how they're how they think they're doing in the scope of the world. So obviously if you have satisfied commanders, uh, not only will your commander stay loyal to you, but you know if other characters uh, around the world map are dissatisfied, it'll be easier to try and persuade them to join your cause. So the satisfaction, I think they call it the the Guanji. Um, well, that was more about ties between characters, but it also involves satisfaction. Um, so yeah, all of that being very interesting. So, I mean, that's one of the things that kind of strikes you when you look at this video, is how much more there is to, to chew on here in terms of all these traits. And I, I am interested to see how they all play out together. You know, it all looks cool here from a menu, uh, from the theory that they've put forward, but we'll have to wait and see, you know, in actual gameplay, how it all comes together, if it is actually meaningful or if it can be gamed uh, quite easily. Um, so yeah, we're waiting for that. And take a look at this. There is actually an abilities tab down here. So presumably that's the stuff that starts to get a little bit iffy, which is like uh, we saw in one of the, the previous ambush battles where people were like striking the ground and having shock waves. I think the abilities is going to be that type of thing. So probably expect the abilities to be gone if you're playing the, you know, the, his the records of the Three Kingdoms version, or perhaps the abilities are going to be more tied to like a formation unlock or something like that. Whereas in the Three Kingdoms ver version, it's going to be the one where you ground pound and do all this crazy stuff. Uh, but right now he doesn't have any unlocked. Uh, let's see, he's going to scroll over to the character here. Again, a recap of some of the traits. And I guess as you get more authority, it does then increase your public order. Um, yeah, so a lot, a lot to see in this menu. Very excited to see that. Um, and now he goes to the faction summary. Again, I really love the aesthetics. Um, so yeah, one of the things we're going to see here is that right now we're a pretty low ranking official. We're going to be a noble. 
and it keeps track of when you earn this. Um, and essentially what it says is, hey, you need to increase your prestige in order to move up the ranks. And then moving up the ranks essentially is going to allow you to have more armies, more assignment capacity, more administrative provinces, uh, or no, sorry, administrators just period provided, uh, and then trade agreement capacities. So it's it's like a reworked Imperium um, with a new coat of paint going up all the way to the king, I guess, which is cool. Um, but I mean, if you were to cover this up and just show me how it works, it's pretty much Imperium. Uh, I do hope that they add something a little bit more interesting uh, to it. Um, but it, it is some different stuff than we've seen before. Uh, trade agreements being capped, I don't think we've seen that before. Um, so yeah, they're going to try and rope in a lot more to it. One of the things that I was also thinking that would be interesting is like, okay, if you're moving up all the way to the king, um, perhaps there's some new mechanic that comes into play. I was starting to think about the end game where if you think about it, in previous Total War games, they try and figure out some way to kind of strike you down when you're all the way, you know, in the late game. So presumably when you're king. And so what I was thinking is there's this concept in Chinese history, which is going to be the mandate of heaven. And usually when a new dynasty, you know, positions itself to, to rule and unite China, it says we have the mandate of heaven. And they make all these justifications. The historians write that they are upright uh, you know, they they have the mandate of heaven, they have the right to rule because they're upstanding, they're honorable and all that. So my theory is that perhaps the late game is going to be based around the mandate of heaven. That at first, when you reach king, you're going to have that mandate of heaven. But then over time, you know, you're going to start to lose that mandate of heaven. And perhaps if it gets below some sort of threshold, maybe it'll trigger something where, hey, you've lost the mandate of heaven. And that will trigger something like Realm Divide that we saw in Shogun 2. Uh, so that would be something very much in theme with Chinese history. Losing the Mandate of Heaven is something that was a told of, you know, at the end of dynasties. It's always the same story where the rulers start to you know, retreat into their, their palaces and do nothing but eat and, and have sex and, you know, debauchery. And they forget about the kingdom and they lose the Mandate of Heaven. Now, of course, all of that is, you know written after the fact after this happened by the next dynasty that's trying to discredit the previous ruler and you know bolster themselves up so of course they're going to write that the last king that they outed was you know uh, a degenerate but uh, anyways it, it's still there as kind of a trope so i'm interested to see what will happen i'm also interested to see that here the top title is king and then after that there's another little bubble here what is that? Is that Emperor? I'm not quite sure what's happening. But anyways, lots of interesting stuff going on here. If we look on the right-hand side as well, some more stuff we can pick up for the UI. These are going to be different uh, characters, I suppose. This is definitely a spy. Uh, this is some sort of, I guess, general. Uh, here's rice. So they did say food is going to be important to the game. Here's uh, gold. Don't know what the tree is. Scroll. Perhaps it's technology. Here's how many armies you have. And this one here... This saddle or brooch looking thing is actually going to be the ancillaries. So five means that you have five of, you know, the, the swords or the horses or the suits of armor that are available to be given away. So I guess one of each is going to be directly tied to your character. And then the rest here, I guess, get tallied up and you can give those away uh, for trade. Another interesting thing here is the 350. Um, is that population or is that the size of your army? I thought last time we checked the size of the army was 700. So if this is population... You know, obviously it's not 350 people. Maybe it's 350,000. That seems like a lot. But anyways, keep an eye out for that. We'll try and see if population is making a comeback. I've heard some rumors from people who believe it is, but it has not yet been confirmed. And yeah, as this moves up, I mean, you can see this. Yeah, gain prestige to unlock. So like I was saying, it's pretty much just a reskinned version of Imperium. Uh, and now they're going to go ahead and click on this village. Again, they've reworked the village system, uh, or I should say the kind of province system. So before we're used to kind of the region capital with a certain number of building slots and then the minor settlements around it. Looks like that's not really going to be the case. It's some sort of different type of system, which is interesting. So basically what you have here is your large village, level three. And this is currently, I guess, the capital of this faction. And take a look at this. It has currently three building slots. This one seems to be open here. So I guess level three means you get one, two, three buildings and then hopefully as this tiers up four five six seven you know maybe up to ten maybe you can have ten slots they haven't yet talked about that but uh yeah that is kind of my theory for the time being uh or you can perhaps oh let's see this that's turns 
Okay. Yeah, upgrade. Um, so I'm not sure if the upgrade will eat into your building slots, or maybe this this village can only, or maybe you know, villages or large towns can only ever get three. So still something uh, to wait and see. Uh, but let's see, what else can we can we pick out here? Okay, so they click on this one. So this is the empty building tile. You can go down several different routes. So here we get to see uh, the flavors that you're going to be going down. So this one is going to be military focus. This one is going to be management focus. This one is going to be uh, upgrading your weapons and armor. Lodging here, schools and marketplaces. Interesting. Going to beef up your economy. And then government support, land development, grain storage. Not quite sure how that plays out, but I have read in the blog post that grain storage uh, is very key. If you want to build up your food supply and be able to hold it over time and then use that as a tradable resource, you want to start to invest in grain storage. So, you know, more and more here being added. And again, we do see in the bottom left corner 350 next to what looks like uh, a couple people standing there. So we're still not sure what that is, if that's actually some sort of representation of population or perhaps it's the amount of potential soldiers that you can recruit in the next turn, like the available recruitment pool. Um, so yeah, there's something still to be seen. Well, we'll wait and see. Oh, and another thing I guess I didn't mention is that when you look at this large village and these three tiles, it looks like these three buildings are all located here. But take a look at this. The toolmaker, there's a divide. So it looks like we're going back to a system kind of like we had in Empire, which is where you have your like specialty buildings that you can upgrade and they're still kind of part of the main settlement but they're located away from the settlement and so thus vulnerable they don't have a garrison uh, kind of interesting similar to what they were doing in thrones where you have these smaller settlements that can only do like one or two things so in this case make tools um, and again take a look at this two people 350 people so i'm still very interested to see what that means is it 2200 um, I still don't know what that means. Is this recruitable? So does that mean you can recruit just two people from the toolmaker? That seems a bit low. So yeah, I have no idea. Hopefully uh, CA will clarify. But as you look around, it looks like um, over here I do see Zheng Yang uh, toolmaker. I don't think that's ours. So I'm trying to figure out where that toolmaker uh, building of ours was located. Perhaps it's the one up here, but that looks more like a river crossing. So I'm not quite sure what to make of that little uh, thing, but also take a look around uh, more of these little things. So toolmaker, jade mine, iron mine. So there's definitely, you know, the industry is kind of spread out about. Uh, and then as we move down, these are all going to be vassals. So in the video, they state that there's two vassals. There's a one here. So they own kind of two structures I don't know what we're gonna call these the town and then the farmland each of them being run by a dude oh no sorry 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 so this is yeah so this is a village and this is a town and then the farmland is actually the status of the warrior or the army so he's close to the village not necessarily in it he's in the farmland this guy is in the close to a livestock farm but it doesn't I guess there is a building I'm starting to get confused by all this um, yeah, because look, there is a structure here. So that's all, yeah. Okay, we're going to have to get used to this. But anyways, it's all it's all quite interesting. I really like the idea of the distributed building stuff that you can attack that's vulnerable and that you can even um, vassal with. So as, as he clicks on this person, it says he's your vassal. So what, what the heck? That's, that's so weird. Um, I mean, it's cool. It's very period appropriate. What I mean by it's so weird is this is a livestock farm and I can make the owners of a livestock farm my vassal usually you know we're used to it being more like a little uh, a small kingdom or something or some other city state that you make your vassal here your vast your vassalizing making a vassal of a livestock farm cool i mean i dig it this is very period appropriate where you're going around and you're recruiting these small villages into your coalition the idea as well that we saw with the armies that are made up of several um, coalitions of you know generals with their retainers very very much liking that uh, and what you'll be seeing is that this spills over oh actually I just noticed something as well so take a look at this town is level 5 village is level level 2 the large village was level 3 so okay that goes to my idea where it keeps going up and up if town is level 5 you know we still haven't seen city so city and maybe capital you know, if town is five, maybe we, it'll go up to seven or eight, or maybe even 10 is capital. Uh, we'll see. So yeah, I, I like that. Much better differentiation of the structures, lots of little structures. This one's a trade port. So I love the diversity of all this. This, oh, 
Nope, small town. I'm trying to see if we can uh, pick out anything from the map here. I think they did go over to the right hand side. Uh, let me just scroll through this real quick. Another large village, three, one, two. What's this one on the right? Okay, small town. So we've seen all of them, uh, at least in this vicinity. So anyways, they click on this guy who's your vassal, and then they're going to start to take a look at it uh, in just a sec. So let's pop on into this. So he clicks on the livestock farm, or he could, and he's going to click on the, the guy next to him. Boom. Okay, now we enter into the revamped diplomacy menu. So this thing's really cool. I'm actually going to let this play. Um, it's relatively straightforward. But anyways, what they're showing here is that you have all kinds of different options. Here you can request... Uh, as you can see, a ton of stuff. Here are the ancillaries that we mentioned before. So the ancillaries being like swords, horses, etc. that you can trade out. So there's all kinds of stuff that you can pay. And with the new system here, it's straight up, they tell you what the odds are. So right now, they've introduced this kind of like point system. So basically here, if you're requesting this, then you need to give them a um, plus one. So you need to give them 12. Uh, something worth 12 of whatever this value is supposed to represent their their willingness to do it So it doesn't mean that there are no it means that you have to start the haggling There's a quick button down here that says make this work Which if you click that it'll basically auto generate something that'll give you plus one over this to make the deal work And yeah, here you can see where it comes from. So the food amount basically says Yeah, that's where it's coming from probably they they don't want to give up food because they're very limited on it, so that's why it's negative eight. And then your base diplomatic stance is just not so great. So already, you know, if you make good friends with someone, they'll be willing to give you not the sweetest deal. But if you're not on firm footing, it'll be harder. So already, you're starting to see the depth of all this. Uh, really, really digging it. Uh, so, and take a look at this, trade territories. So you can now exchange territory, something we've been asking for in quite some time that we thought was lost to the ages is making a comeback. So that's a cool one to see. Um, yeah, all very, very cool. Ar arranged marriages, those are going to continue to be there. And if you read the blog as well, marriages are fairly in-depth where they can come along with deals. And what you can also do with marriages is you can choose where the, the married couple is going to settle, whether uh, they're going to go to, you know, the other person's territory or to yours. And by making that part of the deal, you may be able to bring over the husband or the wife as a character to your faction. So all kinds of stuff. And I really like how they're blowing this all out. Um, giving us control over everything, not only because it's going to make it much more, uh, much less stale, but also when modders get their hands on this, it's going to be incredible. Uh, so yeah, he just did the the make it happen, which automatically just pulled from money, uh, pulled from your pile and did just enough to have plus one over the enemy. So there you go. So you could do that or you can go ahead and try and do uh, some other stuff. Take a look at this. Issue ultimatum. Issue ultimatum, as they'll demonstrate, basically just says, hey, do this deal or I will declare a war on you. And if you do that, it no longer tells... Well, we'll wait for that in the video. Let's take a look at the other stuff. Peace with uh, Cao Mao. Uh, so all kinds of stuff. Call people to arms, declare independence, support independence. So a lot of them aren't available because you must be at war with factions. But take a look at how much stuff you can do here. God, this is going to be freaking amazing. A lot of uh, politicking that you'll be having here. Uh, and so, you know, if you're playing the records of the Three Kingdoms, uh, that's going to be so much more important. And you can, oh my god, that's, this is going to be great. This is so cool. Uh, so, yeah. So now they're, they're showing all the various things. Diplomatic treaties as well that you can do. So many options to try and finesse it. Uh, this one, offer guarantee of autonomy. All kinds of new stuff that they're offering. But this one essentially says... Hey, this would make them really happy. Basically, what uh, they're telling you in the video is that if you do this, basically what you're telling the enemy or this vassal is, hey, if you do this deal with me, I guarantee to never, ever annex you. And that's like a great deal. And if you break it, then what it'll do is it'll drop down your trustworthiness, which means future deals, you'll have more penalties and it'll be harder to strike those deals. Uh, so all kinds of cool stuff. Um, yeah, loving it. So there you go, deal signed. Uh, so you, you saw that takes quite a lot of finagling to try and make it work. Um, so CA has uh, created a like quick deal option at the top. And they'll be demonstrating that real quick. Uh, first, they're going to again show this. Um, this is pretty cool as well. So they've introduced um, not just one-time payments, but regular payments over time. Uh, that I think in the blog they stated that it was a standard of 10 turns. Uh, up to 10 turns, I guess, that the payment is made. So that's cool. So 
in the past where you had to put, provide like a lump sum in order to get the enemy to do something. Um, that might have been hard, but now you can make that payment over time. So just adding more flexibility to your deal making, uh, and this is all great. I haven't played too much of the Paradox games, so I don't know how much they're ripping off from them, but it, uh, I can tell as someone who's not even familiar with that title that CA definitely got this influence and inspiration from somewhere, and I think that is the most likely candidate. So you guys let me know if this uh, smells quite a lot like Paradox. Yeah, I mean, if it does, that's no problem to me. I mean, people have been asking for those features to be brought over for so long. Uh, yeah, let's skip forward a little bit. So CA continues uh, to finagle here, showing the payments. Uh, and then what they're going to be showing here is, yeah, the ultimatum. So you'll notice here in the ultimatum, it no longer tells you just how close you are to reaching a deal. So you don't know how likely uh, it is to pan out. Uh, and then what they're explaining is that if you go ahead and coerce the enemy, then there's going to be some sort of algorithm in play where the enemy says, is it worth it to us to part with 1,000 or go to war? The value of the war, they're going to calculate that based on, you know, how strong are you? How strong are, our, are all your vassals? How much is it going to cost us to go to war? So really, really cool stuff. I'm, yeah. This is this is all all looking good, but like I said, it does need very much a test drive to see how it plays out. Um, so what else can we see? Yeah, they're gonna coerce, and that's where it reveals. What, yeah, <laughs> deal rejected. Boom. And now, uh, presumably, I think that means that they're at war with you. And if it were a a main faction, it would bring all their vassals uh, into the fight as well. And there's the quick deal option that I was referencing where, hey, if you just want to get a straight up deal, um, just go for it. Peace, non-aggression, military access, trade agreement, or become a vassal. There's even more of these. Demand autonomy, uh, confederate seems to be back as well. So, yeah, a lot to sink your teeth into. So this is a, this is a good trend to be on. Uh, we've been scared that CA was going the route of dumbing down their games, uh, stripping features, and this seems to be them turning it around. There was a big uh, hubbub last time around with them stripping the features for this game when it came to, for instance, uh, naval combat, getting rid of that, especially uh, given the, the historical importance of river battles and river control in this title. That was something that people were very sad to see. So I'm curious if this redeems the game in, in people's eyes, if this is really showing that CA... Well, I'm going to say it from my perspective, this clearly shows that they're trying to add new things to the title. Uh, but we'll have to see if it outweighs the things that are stripped. But if anything, it does bode well for the future. And I still have very many open questions about what is going on with this map here. How do these little minor settlements work? Um, how does the kind of building tier work? Uh, oh, all kinds of crazy stuff uh, going on here. And obviously on the left-hand side, if you look at these announcements, oh, I guess maybe those are all trade deals. Uh, I was thinking it was all placeholder stuff, but no, there is a second deal here. So, yeah. Yeah, very cool. And that's it. Anyways, that's it for part one. I'm curious to see what's going to be in part two. Uh, but like I was alluding to, if you want to get more out of this, you can go ahead and look at the Diplomacy blog here. Um, they go over most of the stuff we already talked about and give you some scenarios. Uh, I don't think it's worth me reading it off here. I'll link it below, um, but they do give some interesting scenarios. So for instance here, talking about... Um, if you want to make a deal work with someone, you only need plus one for it to work. So if you're currently at a deal where it's plus seven, then don't make that deal. I mean, get get more out of it. Request, you know, it means that you have some wiggle room. So ask your your fellow interlocutor, whoever the deal maker is, hey, can I have that horse? Uh, and just get as much out of the deal as possible. So here they talk about how that's might that's how you might be getting a stallion. Uh, they talk about how vassals work, how you know, it's not that bad for yourself to become a vassal. They've retuned how vassalage works. Um, you pay a tithe, but in response, you're under the protection of that faction, all kinds of stuff, gaining independence, requesting liberation, cutting deals, asking for permission for war, all kinds of stuff. Uh, they talk about trade and marriage, stuff that I already brought up. So anyways, a whole ton of stuff coming down the pipeline here. It's gotten me way more excited for Three Kingdoms, which has been kind of going under the radar when they have all the flashy Warhammer stuff coming out. But anyways, I'm very excited for this, and hopefully I'll be able to put together some um, some documentaries about the Three Kingdoms period here soon to give you the proper context going into this, because I know, you know, it looks beautiful, it looks great, but always... Uh, 
at least for me, I need that historical background in order to get properly invested in a title. So hopefully we'll be able to provide that here soon. Anyways, I've been ranting and raving long enough about a video that's just six minutes long, so I hope you got something good out of it. I did watch a Legend of Total Wars video as well, so he did his quick responses. Go ahead and check that out too. He's known in the community for being uh, quite honest with his remarks, quite critical about Total War, and he's pretty excited for this. So anyways, if that's a barometer for the directions he is going, I think it, uh, it bodes well. But yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for watching, and see you in the next one. Peace out.